<laughs> a very warm welcome. You are watching 3T TV, Thika's number one online news channel, where as always, we are telling the Thika story as it is. My name is Juliet Modoni, and today I have a wonderful guest on set who is going to give us her journey. The most interesting thing about it is that she's not an old person. <laughs> she's equally young, but she's gone through life and she's emerged victorious. We hope that by the end of this segment, we will have encouraged someone who is back at home. And if you haven't subscribed, we'll give you good reason to. So let the segment begin. How are you doing? I'm good. Happy New Year. Or oh, it's not Happy new. Happy New Year. Yeah, no, it's still New Year. It's still, eh? Yeah, yeah. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. How have you been? It's been a while, yeah? It Many has. years. Yes. I've been well. Please introduce yourself. There's somebody who's, who doesn't know who you are. Introduce yourself and let us know who you are. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and do a very brief intro. <laughs> so my name is Wanji Kongetha. I also go by Christine. So Christine Wanji Kongetha. I am a daughter. I am a mother. I am a sister. I'm a new auntie. Um, what else? I'm a homeschooler. I am uh, working with a CBO currently as well, and an entrepreneur. That's a lot of things, huh? A lot, by the way. Tell us about your upbringing. Are you, how many are you in your family? Oh, nice. Okay. So usually when I talk about my family, I like saying I grew up in a very functionally dysfunctional family. Um, in our dysfunction, we functioned. So I am the eldest of three. I have uh, a brother and a younger sister. And then in addition to that, I have a foster sister. And um, that's now my, my family, birth family. Mm -hmm. And then now in my house, I have two daughters. You do? Yes. Awesome. What are their ages? I have, my eldest will be turning 17 mm -hmm. in about a month. Mm -hmm. And my youngest is about 10 and a half. Wow. Yes. Two diverse age, age Very groups. different age groups, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before we get to you being a mother, mm -hmm. uh, how was it growing up? What school did you go to? Oh, okay. Mm. So I, I grew up in, I, my parents, I wasn't born in Thika. Mm -hmm. So my parents moved to Thika when I was pretty young. Um, and uh, I continued to live here until I was about 25. So in my formative years, I went to... Gosh, I went to very many schools. I'm not sure. We, we hey, have enough time. Let's see. I'm told I went to two different nursery schools okay. that don't exist anymore. So. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then I started my schooling at Camino Primary School okay. for about one year. When I was in my class two, I moved to Holy Rosary, where I stayed until class six, that is 1996, at which point I moved to Goodwish, class six to class eight. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to Chania Girls High School, uh, that is between uh, 1999 to 2002. And then finally I did one more year of Form 4 in a school called Reverend Mohoro, all the way in Nyeri. That was in the year 2003. What brought about that? Uh, going back to Form 4? Yes. Um, like I said, I've grown up in a very interesting family, yeah? And so my, my dad being um, among the youngest of his siblings, it also stood true that he would get counsel from his older siblings about some things. And so when my results came out, part of the family felt that, number one, I was very young to, to go to college because I cleared high school at 17. And uh, I had not qualified to do a degree, which meant if I did a diploma, I would only be in school for about two years, working at 19. So that made people uncomfortable. <laughs> so I was sent back and also to see if I could get um, a higher grade in order to go in as a job student, like direct entry yes. campus, yes. Mm. Yeah. How did that sit with you, seeing that, you know, the people that you finished school with, the probably in college, you, you've been told to oh. go back, and you hadn't failed per se? Huh. I, uh, part of it, I think, I, I didn't really need to think about it because I wasn't given a vote. I was informed this is what is happening. And number two, at least where they gave me a voice was when they gave me the choice of where to go to school. So I chose to go to the school where my bro was, which was a mixed school. Mm -hmm. So that meant I had company. Mm -hmm. That also meant I was out of town so I could hide the fact that I had rewound mm -hmm. from friends. Mm -hmm. But other than that, honestly speaking, that one year was a good thing. 
because it, it allowed me to, to realize that some of the things that I found really, really difficult in high school, some of the subjects that were really, really hard on me was a mindset issue. So when I was put in a different environment, I, I actually did do better. Wow. And um, again, it was challenging because they, they picked a school where I did different subjects the second time round. Mm -hmm. So I had to go in and do agriculture all over again from form one to form four because they didn't have French. So there are kidogo, kidogo stresses, cultural shock as well. You've grown up in Thika, you've schooled in Thika, and now you've gone all the way to Nyeri. As much as it was my home village, it was significantly different. Mm. But again, I did not get a vote, but I enjoyed that year immensely. <laughs> it turned out well. Yes, it, it did. Out well. Yes, it did. Now, after high school, then where did you go? All right, so after high school, I... One of the other things that happened during the course of high school was that, like any other girl, you know, you're getting into relationships as a teenager. And up until that point, I had I had, had the unfortunate um, chance to have been in two abusive relationships before I turned 18. Mm -hmm. And so the year that I was in, in uh, my phone, for the year that I rewound, I happened to be in one of those relationships. And what was happening in it, it wasn't physically abusive, but it was very verbally and emotionally abusive. Mm -hmm. And so this person had spent a lot of time telling me, pointing out all the things I should change mm -hmm. about me for me to be a better person. So ironically, as I was finishing Form 4, this relationship ended and I had sunk into some form of depression which people around me didn't really notice. So stopped eating, lost a lot of weight, went to the gym, and for the first time in my life, I was a size, I think I was a size 12. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm enjoying this whole being a size, not really enjoying because I was in a dark space, I, I happened to run into this guy that I had known for a very long time and honestly, I had had a crush on him, you know, teenage crushes. And, and interestingly enough, his first, the first conversation we had was about my body. Okay. Like, why have you lost so much weight? I liked you before. And this was strange because growing up, um, I grew up with a very low self-esteem. I look very different from my siblings. Uh, I am the darker one, I am the bigger one. So when you grow up in an African home, you're constantly reminded Unakula chakula wengine, you know? You're, these people are not getting enough to eat and that's okay. why you're that size and they're this size. Mm. So growing up, I always, it was very obvious to me that I was different from my siblings and it's taken a long while for me to stop seeing it that way, you know? So having someone point out the, why did you lose weight and I liked the other version of you, my heart and I, we fell totally. And what followed was, for lack of a better word, I would call it whirlwind romance. Okay. But which was quickly slowed down by me finding out I was pregnant about three months mm -hmm. into that relationship. You're 19. I, um, I had just turned 19. I was waiting for my Form 4 results. I was living at home. Not wow. a penny to my name. I didn't own anything. Mm -hmm. The first thing, I, I, I joke about my daughter saying the first thing I ever owned in this life mm -hmm. is my daughter. That was the first thing that I could ever call mine. Mm. So, back then, Thika was small. Yes. And getting pregnant out total of wedlock, that news would go like bushfire, you know. Mm. And then add on the fact that your mom is a church leader, mm. you know. And then my dad, I was scared of my dad. So, I like regular girls for me, I came home. And I told them immediately, this is what's happening and I'm pregnant. So... My mom went mute for four days, mm -hmm. kneel by mouth, kneel by mouth. But then I wasn't kicked out. Mm -hmm. And baby daddy was still around, though he had also cleared form four. So we were two teenagers, two 19-year-olds, and a pregnancy. So after about four days, mom came home with Uzi and uh, knitting needles and said, you know what, this baby will be born and this baby will need sweaters, so twende kazi. Mm -hmm. But with my dad, it was different. And now looking back, being a parent, I understand why it was different for him. With my dad, it wasn't very nice. And we had a very, it was a rocky nine months. Okay. It was a very, very rocky nine months. Um, where I actually, I considered, well, death, death seemed better. Okay. Um, it was also hard because, you know, people don't talk about 
getting pregnant out of wedlock. And when you get married and you had a child out of wedlock, you quickly get this father figure for the baby and you move past it. And we never really point out and say, so and so got a child out of wedlock, but they made it out. Yes. And so, lucky for me, the people that were in my life at that point, they began to talk to me about people in my life that had gotten children out of wedlock, mm -hmm. but things had worked out for them. Yes. That didn't make sense to me, mm -hmm. especially because these people I was being talked to, talked to about were like church folk. There were people with right standing in the church. Mm -hmm. And these stories were not really spoken about. And at the point at 19, the church had rejected me, the church where I was raised. Mm -hmm. And not directly, but the, the, there was a lot of um, whispering and a lot of finger pointing yes. that I was mm -hmm. no longer comfortable. Yes. Anyway, so I decided to start looking at obituaries mm -hmm. in the newspapers. Wow. Because, see, in the obituaries, people just write. They write wife of da da da, -da mother to da da da. -da. So if I find someone and, they are, they, and the obituary says mother to this and this and this person, but there's no husband. Mm -hmm. And this lady has Kitambaya Guild. I remember once finding a guild lady and once finding a professor. Mm. And for me, I knew I was going to be okay. <laughs> Which is sick. Like you, you do. Because there could be so many reasons why someone is single. But in my 19-year-old brain, mm -hmm. all I knew was they do not have a husband. They had children. And some even have multiple. Me, I only have one. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting one. And... If they made it, if they made it to guild, if they made it to PhDs, if they made it to being doctors, then there's a chance that this 19-year-old girl, mm. there's hope. Mm. But honestly speaking, I did not see this far. <laughs> like, it's not one of those things you're 19 and you're seated and you're thinking, oh, to mm -hmm. you're hoping. Mm. So a few months after I turned 20, I got Amy. Yes. Yes. Bundle of joy. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. You're yes and no. Yes. yes and no because um, a child is joy. Yes. But there's such a thing as time, you know. There's such a thing as being prepared to to bring a child. Like a baby is a full time responsibility, and not just because of the money aspect, but also because of the commitment aspect. Mm -hmm. Like Amy, Amy is much older now, but she's still my baby, and. Even when she's 30, she's still going to be my child. If she comes back home, she is my child, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. So beyond the money, which I did not have at <laughs> the time, mm -hmm. beyond the job that I did not have, there was also the emotional stamina yes. that I needed to be able to do motherhood. There is the preparation, and I didn't have much of that. Actually, my gynecologist kept telling me, 20 is an old woman. Like every time I would go and I have aches and pains and I'm feeling like a baby and he'd be like, 20 is a grown woman, you're not a child. So there was that aspect. Mm. So getting Amy was special. Like I, I remember looking at her all night and thinking, oh my God, especially when I realized that around, like somewhere in the middle of the night that she had a dimple, oof. <laughs> you forget you don't have money for milk and stuff. Mm. Um, but then it was also difficult because her dad was present at the time and would have wanted to be part of the hospital experience and my father was not having any of that. So to the point of nurses being able to own, eh? like AMZ and all of that. So I, we had this wrangle at home, you've gotten pregnant out of wedlock, the guy wants to be involved. My dad doesn't want to hear any of that because traditions. And then on this other side, you're trying to celebrate having Amy. Yes. So it was a mixed bag of emotions. It was a mixed bag. but. I mean, we are in Thika, so I can say the most amazing thing for me was the church folk that I thought would turn. Mm -hmm. For some reason, when Amy was born, mm. things just aligned. Mm -hmm. From having a, a, a well-respected bishop walking into my mother's house three days later and dedicating her yeah. to having a pastor's wife coming to hospital to see me because my mom was, was out of town. Mm -hmm. So all of that was very interesting. Yeah. But then again, three days later, my mom had to travel for work. Mm -hmm. And so I was left home alone with uh, Amy, a small baby, and a younger sister. So let's just say I, I, I grew up way too <laughs> So you have way a baby who is a week old? Three days old. Three and days I old. have a younger sister who is 10. Wow. And a house and a home to run. 
and I have my own self who's recuperating. Yes. Yes. And a very traditional dad who needs his food and his whatever done. Mm. So grew up very fast. <laughs> you actually <laughs> did. And it worked well because you learnt a lot in the journey. So Amy yeah, yeah. Amy came into your life and it has been quite a journey after Amy. So Amy and I stayed home mm -hmm. and I went to college and then her, her dad remained very much in the picture and when she was around two, my dad chilled enough for him to be able to be fully part of her life. Mm -hmm. So um, he and I dated for about seven years okay. and when I was about to turn 26 mm -hmm. and at that point Amy was five and a half, mm -hmm. I got married ah, to her okay. dad mm. and that's when I left Thika. Mm. So, I moved uh, and went and started life somewhere else, okay. and within a year, Amy got a sister. Awesome. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Two babies now. Two babies. 23, I'm assuming. No, at that point now, I was 26. When I got 26. Abby, Abby is my second born, mm -hmm. I was 26. 26. Yes. So now you're 26, you have two children, and now you're married. Mm -hmm. So at least things seem to be working. Mm -hmm. And I want to assume you probably had a job. I was in business at the age of 20, at the age of, I think, 21, I began to do decor for weddings and the like. So by the time uh, I was moving away from home, I was, I was in, in uh, business already. Now, backtracking a little bit, uh, I got Amy in 2005, mm -hmm. but then when Amy was about a year and a half, mm. uh, my dad got sick or rather my dad had been unwell but then the illness got a bit serious mm -hmm. and so he collapsed so by the time I was moving away from Thika there was already part of my other um, struggles remember I said functionally dysfunctional family was that while I'm raising babies I also have to be uh, double it up and be a support system because I had a dad who was unwell uh, at home and mm -hmm. And I think that was also what had marked Amy's birth, because mm -hmm. Amy coming into the picture, and then I think that was 2006 being a very difficult year for my family mm. in terms of illnesses, mm. um, accidents. We had an accident that nearly killed the whole family, um, strokes in the family and the like. Mm. So a whole multitude of things. Mm. But then now, uh, uh, by the time I moved to Rongai, I was in campus, mm -hmm. and I had been in business for about three, four years mm -hmm. at that point. So yes, we could we could um, sustain ourselves. We could support ourselves at that point. Mm -hmm. And Amy was already in school. Mm -hmm. Yes. What did you study in campus, and where did you go? To school? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story. Let me see. So initially, I studied human resource management, okay. but I dropped out okay. of campus. Mm -hmm. So I am currently doing psychology. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole 180 uh, degrees from HR. HR to psychology. But then again, that's a whole book as well. Awesome. Yes. So now you're 26. You're now in, you have a family yes. and things are working. How was that for you? How was the marriage, so to speak? Honestly speaking, I, 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 I find people talking about newlywed bliss. Yes. Me, for me, my first year of marriage was hell, honestly speaking. Mm -hmm. And not because there was anything major happening, no mm -hmm. cause of anything he did. It's just we had never lived together mm -hmm. and we would see each other for a couple of hours and I come home and he goes home. But now all of a sudden you're in the same space. Yes. If you guys have a fight, you have to resolve it in the same space. And remember, we have a child already. Mm -hmm. So after your fights have to be metered. Yes. Everything he did was wrong in my eyes. Without even trying, he breathed too loud. He chewed. <laughs> like everything. Like I just couldn't find peace. And within a couple of months of being married, I started thinking, you know what? Maybe I missed my window. Mm -hmm. Like maybe we dated so long mm -hmm. that we missed our window because mm -hmm. we had dated seven years. Mm -hmm. But then there was... And, and weirdly enough, I, I couldn't find anybody to tell because... For me, I kind of thought, number one, Proverbs 31. And that's what I had been told when I was getting married. Yeah, sure. You know, like uh, in my mother tongue, they say, they talk about mutumia gada, you know, and all yeah. the responsibilities. And a wise woman builds mm. her own home. Yes. And then now when you come home and you're told, um, you don't, uh, wisdom demands that you don't um, hang your dirty laundry in public. You don't display it. Mm -hmm. So you contain things in-house. Mm -hmm. So even these small, small things that I was feeling uncomfortable with, I really couldn't 
go to anybody and say mm. and also there was nothing tangible ni mefanyiwa so mm -hmm. really you can't complain yeah mm. um so our uh, first year was like that but then uh, somewhere along the way i found uh, a certain uh, marriage counselor on facebook okay. and i wrote him a message mm. and it was as I think being sincere and being frank has always helped me and mm. it was very like a child's honesty mm -hmm. that this thing I'm unable to do it. Mm. I'm finding it very difficult and I have nothing tangible, I have no tangible reason to be as bitter as I am but I'm just not happy with him. Mm. And he responded and he said, oh wait, actually that's normal uh -huh. for the first year of marriage, mm. you are very much within. So I relaxed. Mm. Um, at around again i think also experiencing first year of marriage while i'm also expectant which my second pregnancy wasn't as easy as the first one okay so i think the combination of those two things mm. so after the first year elapsed i was like oh we got this you know we're good we got this yeah we can do it mm -hmm. um and then our second year was I mean, there was nothing, honestly, after that settled, I, I think we had kind of gotten a routine mm -hmm. or something going. And it wasn't until about three years into the marriage that again I had that moment for, yeah. But that, like, I, I might have messed up by getting myself into this. Mm -hmm. But now looking back, that may also have been informed by the fact that the illness I had talked about earlier had now escalated my dad's illness. And so... Part of that 2013 was going to be used sorting um, that yeah. out. Mm. And so I think that also made it hard on this other side, like feeling that mm. I am not exactly being supported. Now, when you're going through these issues in your marriage, did you ever think about going to church and finding help? You got married in a mm -hmm. church setting. Mm -hmm. You come from a Christian mm -hmm. background. Let's talk about the church. Did it mm -hmm. come through or did you, did you even ever reach out? Honestly speaking, in the beginning, I, I thought I was being a child. So honestly speaking, I never really did bring it up. And not because the church, I'll be very honest, it's not because of the people who are in my life at that moment that I would identify as a church. It's not because they didn't try. Mm -hmm. But it's also because I had not grown into myself in a way that I could be able to defend myself against different claims that would be made in these sessions. Mm. And so whenever we did have those sessions, mm -hmm. I would end up being the one who's explaining myself. Mm -hmm. And because remember Proverbs that you are, yeah? yes. so we are not, we are being wise and, yes. and she does and she does and she does. And I have no problem at all with Proverbs that you are, Mazi. Mm. If that's what you subscribe to, more power, mm. you know? Mm. But then now for me, at that point, I did subscribe and I bought into it completely. This is who I should be and mm. this is who I should uh, emulate. Mm. And remember, you're, coming, you're also coming from a family where you observed a marriage or you've observed different marriages. And if, if mom has now gone back home, uh, what exactly am I going back home to say? W what reason? Mm. Exactly mm. that we can deliberate on. Mm. And so... Every time we went for these meetings, the meetings would get ugly okay. because there would be accusations thrown. And for me, because we are not, uh, you know, dirty laundry, I would take it in stride and apologize. Oh. And so by virtue of that, I f a, a pattern formed. Mm -hmm. And so even at the point when the church really, really tried to help, mm -hmm. it was too late. Oh. Yeah. So, but earlier on, we did, they, it's not for lack of them trying. I think the problem was on our end as a couple, the not timing. on the churches, yes. I think the timing and also the fact that I, I as a person never categorically said I'm in pain and this is what's happening to me. Mm. So then I can't fault mm. the church because I believe if I had gone in, because when I did, you know, at a much later stage, when I did, something was done mm. and my cry was heard. Maybe not in the way I would have wanted it to be heard, mm. but it was. Probably you also didn't know what you were going through, so you didn't know what you're going to talk about. I thought it was normal. <laughs> <laughs> the issues that you had in the house, yeah. that, that's what happens everywhere. Yeah, I mean, when you hear the reasons why people are leaving their homes and you compare that with yours, you're like, ah, man, I'm just being a baby. Like, grow up. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. You were a pastor's wife. Yes, uh, for about, for about at, at year three of my marriage, yes, I, I, 
oh dear, I became a pastor's wife. And I'm going to be honest, I really did enjoy. I did enjoy my, my time of, of service in ministry. Okay. I did. Mm -hmm. um, and being a pastor's wife was interesting because um, you get to see things through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get to see fakeness. <laughs> you get to see fakeness. Okay. Um, you get to be treated a bit as loyalty yes, in the church. Of course. Um, but then there's also pressure. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure, which is also the other reason why you're not just going to tell anybody that things are not working out at home. Because mm. the pastor, your home is supposed to be okay. That's where the spirit lives. I mean, you know. So there was pressure on, there's pressure on, on you as a lady, like mm. to fit in, to, to be a particular way. And then by extension, there's pressure also on the children because your pastor's children. Yes. Yeah. But I was, and for a period, and I, I truly enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, saying to it that you were a pastor's wife, it means you probably used to lead a women's fellowship or something. I can imagine you were a leader sort of ish. Then uh -huh. you were a pastor in year three of your marriage. Pastor's wife year three, pastor year four. Before we get to you being a pastor. Mm -hmm. Year one, the marriage was rocky. So when you were becoming a pastor's wife, the boat was already shaking. Yes, but, but see, it wasn't at that point, honestly speaking, it wasn't, it's not really shaky. Like when I look back at this, the issues we were having, they were, they were based on immaturity. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and and I can't even say my partner both on both levels, yeah. And when you talk about maturity, you're talking about book smarts. Yes. And then you're also talking about emotional maturity. Yes. And I don't think you can make a marriage work without emotional maturity. Mm. And I know that for me, it's taken a journey. Like, it's it's been a full. Like, I'm not even done with my maturity. Yeah, they're still facets of my life where I'm still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And so then if I say that right now, this many years later, I'm 37, I just turned 37 in November. Mm -hmm. So if, if at 37 I can tell you that I've not attained full maturity, then you can imagine what I was bringing to the table at 26. Mm -hmm. So I can't pose and fault my partner and say, oh my God, he was immature. It was two of us. It took two to tangle. Mm -hmm. And so it, some of the things would have been resolved very easily if we had been mature enough to sit down and have a conversation or if on my end as a wife I would have been mature enough to instead of um, mood swings and cold war to be able to say my dear I feel upset because ABCD has happened can we sit and talk about it now I know that not everybody will respond positively to that but then my only job is to communicate that I'm not comfortable now numerous times I also result, resolved or resulted to yelling and screaming and cold war. I was queen of cold war and mood swings, <laughs> you know, and so it's very difficult to work, to work at it on that level. Of course. Yeah. Mm. Um, when it comes to being part of, of say, leading women, yes. I think, and not just with church leadership, mm. I think whenever you're, you're doing something that requires you, that, that puts you in a position of being a public figure, including this, mm -hmm. it also means that you have to master the art of masks. Wow. In changing your masks, yes. yeah? And so I, 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 you have to learn, one of the things that ministry taught me was you have to learn mm -hmm. to compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. And so I have to be able to separate my issues at home from the issues S similar to the way if you're coming into work yes you won't come with your drama sure. you leave your drama at home so pretty much the same way which i don't know if that's the right thing given church is supposed to be a safe heaven and a, a, a refuge but again that was my way of dealing with it that mm. there was there is the mask for that moment when i'm a pastor mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying about maturity, because yeah? you'll be in church and you'll be leading people and even talking to people about how they should be amazing wives. And then in the same heartbeat, you leave church and someone talks to you and you're looking at him like, no, you can fetch your own food. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where maturity comes Exactly, in, actually, exactly, yes. So in. for me, for a very, it, it's taken a very long 
period for me to learn how to operate as is without my masks mm. just be me mm. yeah what you see is what you get but at that point in my life i had numerous masks i had my home mask like family because my family did not know my marriage there was trains um i put him on a pedestal everybody if like he was king he was very deep uh, thing to say then you became a pastor, mm -hmm. <laughs> a minister of the word. Oh my gosh. Um, now, before we get to, to probably me being a pastor, a number of things happened before I became a pastor. Number one, I'll, I'll admit, I did not want to become a pastor. You know, like, not that I was forced, but I did not. And I engaged in a tug of war with myself about it. And cause, because already being a pastor's wife felt like, a very, a very uh, big uh, responsibility. And also, um, I am loud. Like, I am a sanguine. I am an extrovert, social butterfly, life of the party. And if you've met most pastors' wife, they are demure. <laughs> they are humble. Yes. They tread lightly. They do. They do not shout. No. They say, God bless you. No. We just At, look I good. can't even whisper, you know? So that was already a very difficult thing because it meant that I had to shed, that I had to shed me. Your personality. Exactly. Let's talk about how you became a pastor. So how was, how was it that you became a pastor? I think you'd have to go back to the fact that I was raised in church. Yeah? I was raised in church. So as far as religion was concerned, all I ever knew was church, was Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so it goes without saying, like, and especially like... Um, when you're getting, you're saying to get children and you're getting married, you're thinking about more than just you. And so one of the things that was very important for me was that I raised my children in church like I had been raised. Sure. It felt like that was the right thing for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And so gravitating to a pastor's wife, for me wasn't, it wasn't a hard process because it had been transitional. You've grown up in church, you're part of the youth, uh, for a period, my only um, issue would be that the period, you know, pregnancy out of wedlock, mm -hmm. that particular, mm -hmm. that would be the blot. But for the rest of it, I was a church girl, sure. a, a, you know, good we church all, girl. Yeah, we all grew up you in know? church, exactly. singing in church, Saturday mm, in church, Sunday the whole in church. You, you go to Kesha, Kesha people Friday. are going for Dunda, yes. you, you go for Kesha. Sure. When people are going for jam session, you go for this church event or CG youth service. Extravaganza. You know? Exactly. Yes. So having grown up in that, in that kind of setting, um, getting Amy, for me, I thought giving Amy stability meant going back to church. And so... As I went back to church, I think the journey just, it, 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 un, it unveiled itself. Mm -hmm. It didn't, being a pastor's wife did not have much to do with me because I think that was me being um, a helpmate to my husband uh, who at that point, that was his calling. But now when it began to come to me, that became a struggle because now that meant I, the masks, I would need to be authentic. And, and don't, don't misunderstand me. By authentic, I mean it meant that now I had to deal with things more deeply mm -hmm. because, you know, as a pastor's wife, there was responsibility, yes. But then I think you can also, to some extent, kind of get away with kidogo of that immaturity as you... And especially depending on the covering that you have over you. My covering didn't allow much of that immaturity. Mm -hmm. And then also, they did not allow the immaturity. And, and that, was, that has been the privilege that I've had through my ministry journey, that I, I got the chance to work with people who facilitated my growth mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. um, my, my ear as a pastor's wife was complicated by the fact that I was dealing with an ailing dad mm -hmm. who had a poor prognosis. So part of that year was spent waiting for death. And you know, that's a really, like the diagnosis has come and nothing can be done. Sure. And losing my dad in itself sort of changed things, mm. changed my outlook on life, changed mm the things that I considered important. Mm -hmm. um, it made me realize that there were things that I had thought that 
I couldn't do without that. I could, if I could do without my dad, mm. then I could do without some things. Mm. And so as, as the year that I lost my dad, I lost my dad in May and I joined ministry in July. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it also, the pain that I was going through kind of covered some of the, or allowed people to let me get away with a little bit of immaturity for a period. Yes. Um, but then as things got serious, mm. uh, like you, you now realize, oh my God, like this is, this is no longer about me. Mm. Being in ministry is no longer about me. Mm. It's, and I can't do, well, the mask stayed on. The mask stayed on for a very long time because, again, as a pastor, who do you go to tell that your home is not safe mm. or that you're not okay at home sure. or ABCD is happening mm. to you? Mm. No, you carry those ones. You take it to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Amen. That's what you do. <laughs> you know, I can only imagine that kind of a life that you had where, you know, you're only human. Mm -hmm. You're still learning how, you're still learning the ropes. Mm. But you're expected to be this structured person yes. who we all run to. Yes. Now tell me, when was this turning point that now you realized, you know what, I can't sit in this uh, church marriage setting any, any longer. Hmm. And how was that? So in, 20, in 2014, after I lost my dad, um, at this point, things were not okay at home, but you know, like in my mind, I don't know. I don't know what I thought marriage was supposed. Like it wasn't hundred percent happiness, and so there was a, a degree of of contentment, but there was also a very good degree of resentment. We had gotten to that place where, yeah, like you know what, I I will deal with you, and I really have to deal with you. But remember, at this point, I have just joined ministry, pastor's wife. I have a baby who's. Uh, I think at that point, Abby was about three. Mm -hmm. But then fast forward in 2015. In 2015, um, Abby and I had an exchange, and it resulted in it getting physical. Mm -hmm. But then looking back, I realized, um, in my mind, I deserved that. Mm -hmm. in, in the girl that I was at that point, mm -hmm. I felt that I had done something to deserve that. Mm -hmm. And I remember being young and, and reading about, being very, very young and reading about a lady called Betty Cavata, mm -hmm. whose husband burnt her with a stove or something. Yes, I remember. And I remember thinking, Mimi, mm. ay, you know, you know what she says, girls, yeah. you know, if he dares. Yeah. Yeah. But then even when he did, I did not come home. As a matter of fact, I, I began to think of all the things I should have done differently mm. so that this does not happen and all the things I could do differently mm. so that this does not happen again. So to speak, you were self-doubting. Yes. No, I, by this time, one of the, you remember you asked me, I did not know what was happening. Yes. Now the catch, sometimes when you, when you're in, a relationship that is abusive or borderline abusive. Mm. Now, when we talk about abuse, you could be talking about sexual abuse. Mm. You could be talking, it, as a whole, it, it, it's referred to as intimate partner violence. Yes. And violence doesn't just mean hitting. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, my abuse came way before that first slap landed. Okay. And it had come with tearing me down, tearing my self-esteem mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. tearing my self-confidence down. There was always something I needed to fix. Mm -hmm. There was always something that needed to be repaired. Mm -hmm. Now, if you remember, in the beginning, I spoke about growing up with a very low self-esteem. Yes. So me and my low self-esteem, and then there's this, there's this, there's this you need to fix. Mm -hmm. And so for a very long period, the feeling that was for, that I had was I was never in this guy's league. It's like ni favor, uh -huh. you know, because we were from very different worlds. Even in terms of our bringing our family social economic classification, we were different, and it took a very long time. So much so that to me, what was happening in my relationship was normal, until the day a friend sat me down and said, Hi, "No, is this is not normal." Mm -hmm. This is not normal. Mm -hmm. For me, that, that was normal, maybe because of what I had seen in society around me mm -hmm. and also because of my low self-esteem. Okay. So on the day, on the first day that he beat me, mm -hmm. 
I remember sitting at the window of my bedroom and looking outside and my my boss and my friend at the time had come home and the only reason I reported this beating was because um, I, I had to go for a theology class. I was doing theology. Mm -hmm. I had to go for a theology class and I woke up and I was in so much pain. Let me tell you, you don't even imagine getting beaten would cause you much pain. Like you think you'll, you'll only hurt in the areas you are hit. Yes. Anywho, mm. I had to call in sick. And so she came home. And I remember sitting at my window and looking outside and thinking, why did I tell her? Because she was in his face, yeah? Wow. She was yelling at him. And you could just see she was angry. Yeah. And him, he had coward. Eh? Mm. And I remember thinking, I really deserved this. What kind of a wife exposes the husband like this? Yeah. Why would I? Like, mm. we would have sorted this in-house. Mm. And after that, I think we'd gotten into a, what you do. In psychology, you call it the cycle of abuse. Mm -hmm. Beat, apologize, honeymoon, crisis, beat again, and the cycle continues. Mm. And so we got into a honeymoon period, which was a very good honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. And as this was happening, there were also changes going on with his own life, taking up a new job and all of this stuff. Mm. As 2016 began, mm -hmm. like a period like this in 2016, I knew I was in trouble. I tried to have a conversation with him and how that went, I knew I was in trouble. And for the first time in my life, I began to think about a divorce to be, think about a separation, which was a very difficult conversation to have because you, w w what you confess, you possess. According to the school of thought that I belonged to at that time, yeah? as a man thinketh, so he is. So you begin to think about separation, you begin to think about divorce. Those are the things you're calling into your home. And so at this point, even as I began to talk to the church, what you asked earlier is it began to be known within the church that there was a crisis. The advice only came to pray harder, wow. to trust harder, and to stop talking about divorce and separation because you are commanding those things to happen. Okay. You speak what you want to see. Yes. And I remember around the same time, that's when there was the war room mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah? Yes. And so, so many times I sat in sessions where I was asked the state of my, of our family altar. Are you are you guys praying together? Looking back, I, I'm just like, it's perplexing because at which point, if we're giving each other a cold war and silent treatment, if, if there's this constant resentment, at which point will I get to kneel with this person and hold hands with this person and pray? Between my crying and asking God why, at which point do I get the space to to pray about this, like I'm praying about my own heart. And as 2016 went on, remember I'm fully a pastor, running a docket, and more so I'm running Ushering Security and Hospitality, and the anchor of the church. Yes, and I have two children. And I am a pastor's wife still because he is serving. Okay. So. Allow me to cut you short. Uh -huh. Do your parents know what you're going no, through at this point? No, no, no. At this point, I had lost my dad. Now, my mom. Uh, somewhere in between 2016, finally, she just asked. But she did not ask out of concern. She asked because she thought I was being irresponsible. Because at this point, I had gone so deep into like depression that I would sit with her and I'm just staring at spaces or she, I would snap. At this point, I... I, being a mother was the furthest thing from my mind. And I know it's difficult for some people to hear me admit that, mm. but I did go through phases where I did not want to be a mother. Please note, I'm not talking about harming my children. Yes. I just did not want to be. I did not want to carry the responsibility anymore. Talking about children, mm -hmm. you know, now it seems that the environment at home was absolutely cold. It mm -hmm. was not a homely place. It was ni not a nice place, considering the cold wars, there's the physical abuse. How were the children coping with all that? Weirdly enough, the masks worked. The masks worked in the house. Because as far as my children were present, oh, best behavior. Oh. Yes. So my children, up until towards the very, very end, they only experienced very few mm -hmm. situations. And in fact, it's way after that I've realized that they experienced some of those situations. Mm. So my kids, so actually in actual sense, my home was unhappy for me. 
my home was not unhappy for the rest of the inhabitants. So what you're saying is, when it was the two of you, it was Vietnam. Even when there was someone else involved, he would get ways, he would throw comments. But when the children are there, it's peaceful. Um, you see, the thing with um, marriage is that when you're parenting, you find there's a primary parent and then there's a parent who sometimes comes home, but die. <laughs> so um, one of the other things that had happened in, 